I was at an interesting workshop last week in Orlando on medical digital twins. What is a medical digital twin? Well, that's a good question. The, the first question is, what is a digital twin? And the second question is, what is a medical digital twin? A little bit like the definition of like evolution, people tend to get confused about it. Uh, but a digital twin has is a a system that has fundamentally three components. It has some way of measuring the state of a system, and I should say that digital twins initially were really developed in an engineering context, uh, specifically specifically the first digital twins were developed by General Electric uh, to model the behavior of locomotives and then airplane engines, airplane uh, jet engine. And so a digital twin consists of the following. It consists of some way to measure the state of a system, what you think of as important about the state, uh, might vary, but you have to have some way of instrumenting the system and measuring it, if not in real time, at least fairly frequently. The second thing it has to have is some kind of model of how that system behaves and changes in time, so how the system evolves in time. And then the third thing you have to have is some way of comparing the predicted change of state to the actual change of state. And so classically, what a digital twin does is it measures the state of the system, it predicts what it should be at a later time, you measure the state of the system at a later time, you get some difference between them, then you reset it, you start over again, and you keep doing that and say, what good is that? Well, if the predicted behavior of the system starts deviating a lot or in a consistent way from the predicted of the actual behavior, that usually means if the model is good, that something has changed about the system. In particular, uh, if you're dealing with a motor or an engine like a locomotive or an airplane turbine, very often that deviation is an indicator that the thing is going to fail. And so then you take that deviation as a warning that the system needs servicing and you pull it offline and you service it. And that means that you could intervene before the system fails. Uh, in the case of a locomotive, I suppose if the thing fails, it's not the end of the world. You just have a locomotive, a train stuck somewhere. Of course, if an airplane turbine fails, that's more serious. Uh, and while that's not the only reason that uh, airplanes have gotten safer, it's one of the main reasons that airplanes, at least mechanical failures in airplanes, are much rarer. I think I mentioned in class at some point that in the 70s, there was at least one fatal crash of a jet plane every week worldwide. You'd have between 150 and 200 deaths a week from airplane travel. And now uh, a single crash in a year is newsworthy. So that's a tremendous improvement in safety. It's a 50 to 100 fold improvement in safety. And again, the, it's not that there aren't other things that have happened. For example, the, the uh, protocols for how pilots have to behave in the cockpit have been designed to try to reduce human error quite a bit. Um, but, uh, and it's not that you never have catastrophic failures of jet engines or other parts of planes. It does happen occasionally, unfortunately. But the, uh, the frequency of failures uh, especially if turb jet turbines is, is really 
very low. And so if you try to think about this in a medical context, what you want to do is you want to be able to measure the <laughs> health state of a system, whatever that means. Not exactly obvious necessarily what it means. You need to be able to predict it forward in time. That's hard to do for human beings because we don't have a full understanding of how the body works. Uh, and then you have to have some way of comparing the prediction of the experiment, uh, which is also not so obvious. And so doing this in a medical context is not trivial. Uh, it is used. They're what are called online and offline digital twins. So in an online digital twin, you're trying to make those predictions in real time uh, as the system is running. So for example, for a jet engine, uh, you have to be able to make those predictions as the engine is running, or at least have them finished by the time the plane lands so that you can pull it out for service. Um, so the two the two examples of medical digital twins that are the most developed are medical digital twins for the artificial pancreas. So for a lot the, the the development of implantable insulin pumps goes back a fair ways now. It's about 20 years old. Uh, it took a lot longer to develop sensors that would allow measurement of blood glucose. Uh, in a reliable way, but there now are implantable and transdermal sensors for blood glucose that work pretty well. And so those will measure your glucose level. It will have a personalized model of your body's uh, glucose and insulin response. And then based on that, it will actually inject uh, insulin into your body in a controlled way. Uh, to regulate diabetes, and that's a that's a fairly major advance in terms of the safety and quality of of diabetes uh, care. And so that's probably the single uh, most developed form. You'll notice in that case it's it's got an extra component beyond the one that I said because the system is also taking is also intervening. Uh, that's actually a, a human out of the loop system uh, where the where the medical intervention is actually made by the device itself. In in cancer radiation therapy uh, or in some cardiovascular surgeries, they will do um, modeling of an individual patient. For example, they'll do uh, imaging of the aorta or the heart, and then build a have a template model of the aorta of the heart or the heart for general person. They'll customize that from the medical images, and then a cardiovascular surgeon can go in and try out different surgical interventions to try to fix the problem. So that's a classic offline digital twin. It's not quite a digital twin because it doesn't have this concept of repeated measurement and comparison. And typically in that case, you make the measurement once. It's more of a personalized model, but those are often called digital twins. Um, radiation therapy for cancer has been used computer assistance for a long time. You take an MRI image or a CT image of a tumor, uh, that radiate that image doesn't actually tell you exactly where the tumor is. They're fairly inaccurate. And then people will use computational models to try to improve their calculation of tumor margins. And then we'll explore different possible radiation uh, therapy protocols to see which one is the most likely to eliminate the tumor with the minimal damage to the tissue. Uh, and those sometimes are more digital twin-like because they may be used repeatedly. In other words, you may do a image the tumor every month or every two months and ask the question, is the tumor growing back faster than it should, in which case the therapy isn't working? Uh, would it suggest other kinds of therapeutic intervention? But ideally, we would like to be able to intervene, measure more frequently and intervene 
uh, in more subtle ways than irradiating somebody or cutting them in pieces. So, um, but to do that, there's a lot, there are a lot of missing pieces, everything from the sensor technology to the way you do the modeling to the way you compare the model predictions to the actual results. Because human, human health is like weather, it's stochastic. Uh, if I do the same, if I had two copies of you that were identical at this moment, and we went forward in time, the way your heart would evolve, the way many of the systems in your body would evolve would be different. And so a deviation between predicted and, 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 and measured values isn't necessarily an indication of something wrong. And so one of the things we don't really understand is how to use that information to make the comparison between the prediction and the experiment, the clinical measure. So there actually is some sort of basic statistics and probability that needs to get thought about in more detail too. So there are a lot of, a lot of issues in, in the idea of medical digital twins, not least that we don't know what health is. In other words, if I measured, say your blood, if I do a blood draw and measure everything I can possibly measure about your blood, I could in principle say, I want to keep your blood chemistry exactly the way it is now, but that wouldn't necessarily be a good thing because I don't really know what a healthy state of an individual is. And so there's a lot of missing science as well. Okay, well, welcome back everybody to uh, Engineering 4483543. Computational Biology method, Modeling Methods. Uh, this is our eighth lecture. As always, I need to remind you the classes are live streamed on YouTube and made available later on. Don't know if anybody's actually used those, but I hope uh, I hope they're helpful to people. Uh, if people find bugs in the editing or have comments about how to make those online resources more useful, please do let us know. And I want to thank Giuliano again for giving the lecture last week. Today, we're going to move from talking about cells and their behavior to talking about chemical fields and diffusion. Um, this lecture could be a little bit long, in which case we may put some of the exercises from the lecture in the form of homework. Uh, we'll go through enough that uh, you know how to use these systems, and then if, uh, if we need to, we'll move it into homework. So we're going to start out, as always, just uh, asking people for updates on projects. Uh, then we'll introduce the idea of concentration fields and diffusion, uh, how those are implemented, uh, both mathematically and in CompuCell. Uh, in particular, we're talking about the boundary conditions, which are something that we have to think about when you talk about diffusion. And then uh, we're going to uh, do a simple example. And then from that example, we'll learn how to play with those things in player, in top to cell. Uh, and then we're going to do a few examples of uh, how to control diffusion. And I hope at the end of the class to talk about the three uh, critical ideas, which are diffusion length, diffusion time, and equilibration time. Uh, and those are the three the numbers, the two numbers that you're going to use in the diffusion equation are going to be the diffusion constant and the decay constant. Uh, but the numbers that you care about biologically in a system are the diffusion length and the diffusion time. And they're how to derive one from the other is important. Okay. So why don't we start out with uh, updates? If people would like to uh, let me know how they're doing. Uh, if you have something to show today, that's great. If you don't have anything to say, that's fine. Why don't we just go around the room? Uh, Carmen? Um, yeah, so we're working, we're looking to meet with um, the lady who wrote the paper we're working on next week. Um, so we're working with her to get a time set up. And we've just been like individually working on little sections of the project. So it's been going well. Okay, great. No, I don't have anything to show right now. Okay, that's fine. Gabriel. 
Yeah, uh, nothing much to report from here. This is the time when I've got like three conference deadlines coming up. So I'm a little, little overwhelmed, <laughs> but probably by March 10th, my schedule will be completely free. So then I'll be doing, I'll, I'll have a lot of time to, get, to dedicate to the project, but I'm going to be a little, little uh, scattered until, <laughs> until then. Okay. I'm going, I'm going to be away Thursday and Friday this week. I'm giving a seminar in New York at, at NYU. Um, but I'll be back uh, at the end of the weekend. And so then next weekend is good for me to meet with people about projects. I know last week I was out of town. So um, I just want to make sure that I'm available for people as they need it. Okay. Um, Elmer. Well, so I don't know if everybody got that. Elmer was saying that he's been working on the Git repository. And I have to say, I should probably be taking lessons on how to use GitHub repositories from you because. Uh, uh, Giuliano is the local expert, so I, I have uh, always, I'm afraid, deferred to him, and uh, uh, I could stand to have some lessons myself. Okay. Let's see. Maybe it could get some resources that help you, but they need really time to run it and you have to sit behind it, otherwise you will never get it. So Elmer says he's got resources that he could share. That would be useful, but they take time to look at. If you want to send links to things that you think are good, we can put them on Canvas. We can uh, email them to people. It's up to them whether they look at them or not, but anything that you found helpful for their learning would be great. We'd appreciate that very much. So Elmer was just saying he thinks it's worth making the effort to really learn it. So uh, Gabriel says that he'd be very grateful to, for leads on that. So that would be great. Okay, so Jonathan, are you you're you're working with Carmen? Oh, I'm in the Elmer's group. Oh, you're with Elmer. Okay. Anything you want to add? Uh well, I, I couldn't, I'll be honest, I couldn't uh, really hear much of Elmer's audio, so I'm not sure how much he covered, but basically, uh, you know, we just set up the, he, he set up the GitHub repo and we have a, a nano hub workspace. Uh, and then from there, uh, we're, we're going to become familiarized a little bit more with the code uh, in Morpheus right. in the publication. And, uh, we'll regroup and move forward from there. Okay. J.H., did you have anything you want to add to that? No, not much. We're just team CC Trinity is going well with I Elmar hope, and John, Jonathan. Right. I hope I hope the complementary expertise is working out so that they're they're taking the time to explain things so that you can you can learn from them and they can learn from you. Yes, yeah. Good. I'm learning from them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who did we miss? Logan. Yeah, um, 
right now i know um nick got our github up and going and then um he's working on implementing some of the code that we discussed when we met to go over the biology um, so he could probably give you a better update as far as that goes nick yeah um so we have a pretty basic working model but it's just um bacteria cells growing and dying uh, dividing based on that metabolic energy idea we were talking about. And then we also have the alleles implemented and some different like mutation probabilities to try between them, but um, they're just, there isn't anything really functionally for the different alleles to be doing because we don't have any chemical fields yet. Well, I guess after today, we'll be closer to having chemical fields. Yes, I actually I, I looked at lecture eight slides um, a couple of weeks ago, so I've been I've been waiting for this lecture. <laughs> yeah, it's taken a little longer than I anticipated, but okay. So I guess you're anything you want to add today? Okay, great. Well, don't be shy about again. Uh, next week, I'm quite available. So if you want to meet to talk about projects, it's good um, for me. Thank you. Okay, so today we're going to talk about concentration fields and diffusion. And I'm going to show some equations, but I'm not going to go into the details. So uh, there'll be some extra slides that will be skipped. They're hidden, but they're in the deck if you want more details. Uh, depending on people's background, if you've had more physics or more mathematics, some of these things may seem more familiar or less familiar. Again, what we're going to find really is that the key thing is to think about these three numbers, the diffusion length, the diffusion time, and the decay and the equilibration time. And if we understand those, the details of the math aren't going to matter so much. So first of all, we're going to say, what is a chemical field? Well, in reality, of course, atoms and molecules are discrete particles. Uh, but if we have a box that's big enough to have multiple molecules in it and small compared to the size of the system we're studying, then it makes sense to describe the system in terms of a density which varies from place to place, a concentration that varies from place to place. Um, there's actually some interesting mathematics about when that kind of approximation works and when it doesn't. Uh, it could be a chemical concentration. It could be an electrical field. It could be gravitational field. Uh, elect uh, gravitational field really is continuous at some level. I guess if you go to quantum mechanics, it's not, but uh, uh, the scales are very, very small. Uh, but this concept of a field that is a continually varying concentration or amount in space is a pretty powerful one. And basically all of physics is built around it. We're going to find that in biology, just as we often uh, approximate uh, chemical reaction networks uh, as ordinary differential equations, here we're going to be approximating fields as partial differential equations. Uh, those continuum assumptions again assume that there are a large number of particles per volume that you're considering. Uh, in the case of many biological molecules, that's not really true. Um, you only have one copy of each chromosome, for example. So to treat that as a continuum, well, Albert points out two, but I guess it depends on what exactly how you define your element. Uh, but at which stage of which stage of the uh, of replication you're talking about? Uh, but one or two is certainly not a continuum. Uh, even smaller molecules like transcription factors and and uh, singling molecules often exist, and some enzymes only exist in very few copies of the cell. So describing them as a density is a little bit awkward. Uh, but these approximations work pretty well. And for molecules like oxygen or ATP, uh, they're reasonable, or water. Um, we're going to be talking about transport, how uh, species move from one place to another. 
in biology, there are three kinds of transport that one has to worry about. Uh, computationally, we are gonna neglect the first two. The first one is what's called advection, which is, for example, if I have a chemical in a fluid and the fluid is flowing, then the movement of the fluid moves the chemical. And so in the picture I show, there's a picture of pipe flow and I start out with a blob of material in one place and it gets stretched out by the flow as the fluid flows in that pipe. And so the concentration then evolves in a very complex way. And typically we're going to neglect that vection. Uh, inside of a solid tissue, uh, there is sometimes significant flow, in which case ignoring advection is a problem. Um, and it's certainly if you're dealing with things that are carried around in the blood and you want to know how they're carried in the blood, you can't ne neglect blood flow. Uh, lymph is a little bit like that as well. Uh, but typically the tissues that we're going to be modeling in this course uh, don't have large scale blood flowing. Or we're going to come up with shortcuts to get around that. Yeah, Elmer, please. Limp. Well, not lymph, well, lymph nodes, but, but lymph in general, uh, people tend to think about fluid transport in the body mainly in terms of blood, but you have a second network of pipes in your body, which are the lymphatic system, um, and they carry fluid uh, in complex ways. Uh, they're not as dramatic because you don't have a heart to pump the fluid and therefore the movement is a little bit slower uh, and it's not as regular, uh, but uh, lymph moves species around a lot. Uh, one of the things that moves around, unfortunately, are cancer cells. Uh, and so one of the things that happens pretty commonly is that uh, when cancers metastasize, they move to lymph nodes. Yeah. So, so the lymphatics have one-way valves in them. Uh, so it's a series of short pipes with, with uh, septa that are open, that will only allow flow in one direction, or at least prefer flow in one direction. And so when you move, you're more or less randomly compressing and expanding lymphatic vessels. And so that random movement that gets rectified by the one-way valves into a forward flow. Now birds actually have active pumps for the lymph. And insects have lymph and, and blood together. They don't separate the lymphatic and blood system. So uh, birds actually do a lot of things more efficiently than we do. Their, their respiration is also more efficient than that. And their and their uh, uh, digestion and excretion of waste are more efficient than mammals. So a bunch of places where birds are more efficient, uh, but but lymphatic flow is uh, is pretty complicated. It's not studied as well as as vascular flow, blood flow, and there also are flows in other tissues. Um, in your eye, there's a complex flow through the vitreous and aqueous humor uh, all the way out to the tear film on the surface of the eye and to the blood vessels at the back of the eye. Uh, in your bone, there are complex flows inside the bone of liquids. Um, so there are, there are a lot of flows. In your lungs, the uh, mucus that lines the lungs is pushed actively by the cilia in the cells that line the, the tubular structure and the alveoli of the lungs. Uh, so, so there are a variety of kinds of active transport. Um, typically, unless you're actually an expert in modeling flow, we ignore this. And the reason we ignore it is that not that it's important, it's because modeling flow is very complicated and very computationally expensive. And so if you can get away with not modeling flow explicitly, you try to ignore it. But you do always have to ask the question, can you get away with ignoring it? It's not something that you should just assume. 
So <laughs> advection, in a sense, is passive transport. Uh, clearly, there's a pump moving the fluid. But once you're in the fluid, the material, the chemical species, for example, are carried along by the fluid. Active transport tends to happen at the subcellular level. Uh, cells can pump particular molecular species across their membranes, in or out. Uh, crawling cells, of course, carry chemicals with them. That's more advective. Uh, there also are all sorts of molecular motors inside of cells that transport material in vesicles. Uh, again, we're going to tend to neglect those, uh, although transport across membranes is something that uh, CompuCell could stand to do a better job with. Um, so we're going to tend to ignore those, and we're going to focus today on diffusion. And diffusion is the simplest form of transport, and it's fundamentally a passive form of transport. Uh, and it comes back to the diffusion, the, uh, the physics of entropy. Uh, but the basic idea of diffusion is equivalent to the statement that water flows downhill. If I have a high concentration of chemical in a particular region, and I ask the question, what's the probability of a molecule hopping left or right? If the probability of going left or right is equal, what I'll find is that over time, the concentration will gradually equilibrate, will even out in the, in the volume under consideration. And this is purely passive. Uh, advection and active transport take energy. Something has to pump the fluid. Uh, some molecular motor has to move the vesicle. Uh, or some pump system has to move the ions in or out of the cell. Uh, but diffusion is, is, does, is not require external sources of energy. So it happens no matter what. It happens in dead things as well as living things. But the basic idea is that concentrations of high concentrations tend to flow out into regions of low concentration, and concentrations tend to equilibrate in time. Um, theory of diffusion was developed initially to deal with molecular diffusion, but it also applies at the level of bacteria or plankton or animals in environment uh, to heat. Um, and so on. One thing that we will have to face is that, and it's fine for the world we live in, in our simulations, which is that diffusion is fundamentally a relatively short range uh, transport process. Diffusion is effective at moving chemical species over heads of microns to millimeters. It won't move chemical species over distances of meters. And you'll find biologically that. Uh, diffusion and, and active transport tend to get paired up when things have to move over long distance. And we will come back to that a little later. There's this beautiful old movie from Harvard. It's actually more of an animation than Harvard, showing molecules, simulated molecules moving around <laughs> in an environment. As I mentioned, diffusion is an important active tra transport, sorry, important transport mechanisms over short distances. And we'll come back to this when we talk about diffusion times. But the key concept in diffusion is that the time it takes to go a given distance goes as the square of the distance. So if it takes a molecule one second to travel one micron, then it takes four seconds to go two microns. It'll take 100 seconds to go 10 microns and so on, it would take, if I were trying to go 100 microns, it would take 10,000 seconds. And so you see that uh, diffusion doesn't work over, effectively the time scales for diffusion over long distances are, are impractical. On the other hand, cells use diffusion a lot as a fundamental mechanism because it doesn't consume energy. They get it for free. Um, and very often they have to fight it as well as, as use it uh, in particular, cells have water entering the cell all the time, and they have to use a big part of their energy budget actively pumping the water out of the cell. And so one of the ways you know that a cell has gotten sick and its uh, energy budget has been uh, disturbed 
is that the cell will swell up because if it's not producing its energy currency, ATP, the, uh, the water pumps that are continually pumping water out of the cell or bailing the cell stop, and the cell will swell up and eventually burst if, uh, if that lasts too long. Mathematically, we'll define a concentration, which is the number of particles in a volume of size delta x, delta y, delta z. And that's the, so the concentration is the number of particles divided by the volume. And if we saw, draw a little square box and we think about uh, particles entering or leaving the box on each face of the box, we'll draw a little cube. Uh, we could write a flux J on each surface of our cube. And the net change inside, the, inside of the number of particles inside our box is the difference between the inflow and the outflow over all of our surfaces. So if I pick a given direction of my box, uh, the inflow in this direction and the outflow in that direction are the same, then the concentration inside the box wouldn't change. The flux is given by something called Fick's law, which is equivalent to the statement that I showed before that the flow of material uh, is trying to equilibrate differences in concentration. And so the flux at a given position is proportional to the gradient of the concentration. So there's a net flow uh, towards lower concentrations. And that flux depends on the gradient, the change, the rate of change in space of the concentration uh, with a constant D, which is called the diffusion constant. And the di diffusion constant has units of distance squared per time. And that's where this relationship that we just talked about, that the time to go a given distance by diffusion goes as the square of the distance comes from. If I have a flux in and out of my box, uh, the net flux in the whole box is the divergence of the diffusion constant times the gradient. And if the diffusion constant is constant everywhere, then the D comes outside. Uh, the divergence of a gradient is the Laplace. Um, Actually, in biology, very often the diffusion constant is not constant, it varies in space. And then you really should use that uh, divergence form of the diffusion equation. Almost all uh, computational methodologies, physicel, CompuCell, and so on, uh, assume that the diffusion constant is constant, uh, even though it allow for they allow for variable diffusion constants. So they use the second equation, even though they should use the first one. And so that is something that we have to be a little bit aware of. CompuCell will allow you to change the diffusion constant in space, but it will always use that second equation, not the first one. Normally, the diffusion constant doesn't change very fast in space, and so the error made by that approximation isn't big, but one should be aware. Um, the other thing is that the diffusion constant here is assumed to be a scalar, uh, but it doesn't have to be there. Actually, the diffusion constant, if you look at that top equation, uh, we have diffusion constant times a gradient, that is the diffusion constant is multiplying a, a vector and returning a vector. And so the diffusion constant could actually be a tensor rather than a scalar. Uh, and that is something again that we're going to neglect, but that could be of importance if you were doing, for example, uh, transport in neurons, because transport along neurons is much faster than transport perpendicular to them. And so if the a uh, rate of transport is not uniform in space, is, but has a directionality to it, then D is actually a, a, 
a tensor rather than a scalar. Again, in our class, we're going to neglect that. Uh, if I wanted to work on that, it's possible, but we're going to assume for the, our purposes that we don't have to. Okay. Almost all, actually, well, I won't say all. Um, there are two basic ways of representing chemical fields. They're what are called particle-based methods, uh, which are actually more elegant, but relatively few modeling systems use. And they're spatially explicit methods. When we're dealing with something that's actually continuous in space and we want to put it on a computer, we have to discretize it somehow. You always have to discretize to do computation. And the way CompuCell and PhysiCell do that is they divide space up into a grid. Uh, and they say the concentration at each point is something. So you have a floating point number at each position in space. Uh, in CompuCell, uh, the resolution of the chemical field grid is the same as that for the cell lattice. Uh, that makes computation a little bit easier. It also means that the, the, the chemical field lattices are pretty big compared to uh, in some other methods. Uh, you can also define vector fields in CompuCell, um, and uh, we rarely use those. Probably be interesting to use them more. Uh, but you could define uh, a, a, a pair, a number pair at each site in the space, or triple to define a vector as well. CompuCell has a couple of different diffusion solvers. Um, we're just going to use uh, diffusion solver FE for almost everything we're going to do. Um, over the years, there were some GPU accelerated ones, which uh, I don't think are working at the moment. Uh, there's also a steady state diffusion solver, which you can use when the diffusion coefficients are uh, very high. And there's a reaction diffusion solver that's nice because you could have chemicals that react in the environment. And so uh, that one we're probably not going to talk about too much, but if somebody wanted to do some, that might be a good homework problem actually, would be to have people replicate some simple reaction diffusion equations. It would be nice to have those as demos in front of you. So, uh, Let's just walk through what we do to build a chemical field. Uh, typically, we're going to use wizard to do it, or at least when we're starting out. And I'll walk you through the steps, uh, and then we'll do it together. So to create a chemical field, the first thing we do is we, so far, we've always, when we got to that chemical field GUI, we skipped it. But now we're not going to skip it. Uh, we're going to type in the name of a chemical field. Uh, here I'm going to saying that we're going to call it oxygen, but you could give it as usual a name as long as it doesn't begin with a number, or have spaces or special characters in it. Um, the default is diffusion solver FE, which we're going to use, and you have to remember to hit add after you type the name, and you have to type as many the names for each field that you're going to use. As usual, Twitter allows you to go back and edit these things and add additional fields if you need. Okay, so we're going to use that diffusion solver FE. We're going to hit add. Uh, and then, in principle, we would do that for each field that we're going to use. When we're done, we go to next and we do the usual thing. When we look at the output of that, this is going to be in the XML. And the XML file, the CC3DML file, will have put into it a steppable. So the diffusion fields are time stepped alternatingly with the movement of the cells. Um, and you'll see something called steppable, and it'll say steppable type and diffusion solver FE in this case. You'll have the name of the field, diffusion field name, oxygen, <laughs> and then you're going to see a bunch of specifications of the field. The first thing you'll see is field name repeated uh, oxygen. And I'm not exactly sure why we say everything twice here. 
And I've never tried what would happen if you made those names different or if you left one of them out. I know you can't leave the, the top one out. But I don't know what happens on the other terminal. Um, CompuCell allows quite a bit of flexibility in defining diffusion fields. Um, in the simple diffusion equation we've written, there is only one, con one parameter, that is the diffusion constant D. And that corresponds to what's called the global diffusion constant. And the units of the global diffusion constant are voxel squared per Monte Carlo step. And so you have to by hand convert that into the units uh, of your system. If you say that uh, one voxel is uh, two microns in your simulation and one Monte Carlo step is a minute, then the diffusion constant of one would be four microns squared per minute. There's a global decay constant, which we're going to ignore for the moment, because we're not doing diffusion with decay. We'll see there's an initial concentration expression. Uh, you could read the field from a the concentration field from a file if you want. And you could also go as usual in Python and set your fields there as well. Something that's pretty important in uh, diffusion, which we've run into a little bit when we deal with cells, is that our simulated volume is some square or cube, which represents some subspace of the world. And we have to think about what happens at the edges. Uh, for cells moving around, uh, we've seen a situation where the cells divide and they run into the edge and then they get compressed because we're basically in a box, a rigid box. Um, we can define a periodic boundary condition where the cells, when they cross outside of one side of the box, come back on the other side. Uh, we could define uh, rigid walls. Uh, for diffusion, we have to decide what happens at the boundaries. And the main options are periodic boundaries. A molecule that leaves on the left comes back on the right. A constant flux that the flow across the boundaries is defined to be a fixed rate. Um, that is very convenient if we want to define no flux boundary, a constant flux of zero, basically is equivalent of a rigid wall that doesn't allow chemical out of the system, like putting the set box making a, a test tube, for example. Uh, but constant flux with non-zero values is something we're going to play with in a few minutes. And the other one is constant value, where we say that there's a fixed concentration at the boundary. And that uh, could be reasonable. For example, if we have a system that represents uh, fluid in a Petri dish that's exposed to the air, the concentration of oxygen at the top surface is essentially fixed by the concentration of oxygen in the air. If we have blood vessels, uh, the concentration of oxygen at the surface of the blood vessel is more or less fixed. And so constant value boundaries are, are something that we use fairly often. A constant flux is, is a, I guess I we'll find out a little bit trickier to use, although it also could be realistically important. So boundary conditions are specified uh, in a block of CC3DML called boundary conditions. And you'll see a uh, plane axis X, and you have the options periodic, constant derivative, min, left-hand side, constant derivative max, right-hand side. You have option of constant value mid, constant value max. Um, in the X, and you have to specify this for the X direction, the Y direction, and if you're in 3D, the Z. If you're in 2D, you don't have to do Z. Um, if you specify periodic boundary conditions in a given direction, you're done. If you specify constant derivative, or constant value on the min side, you can have either constant value or constant derivative on the right hand side, on the, on the max side. 
you could have constant derivative on the left, constant value on the right, and so on. And you'll find that the, the uh, template that, uh, that Twitit pastes in in wizard uh, has some slightly strange choices. And so you're going to always have to edit those. Uh, if you use the default, you're going to get something that looks rather odd. So our first exercise is uh, I'd like people to go in to wizard. Um, and I will have people do this a little bit on their own for a few minutes, and then I'll do it along with you. Um, create a simulation of a single field. Set the global diffusion coefficient to one. Set the global decay coefficient to zero by changing those two lines. And then uh, set the initial concentration of the field to be one by changing that line initial concentration expression. So instead of X times Y, just make it the number 1.0 and define periodic boundary conditions. And you don't need any cells. Don't don't define any cells. And then run it and uh, display it in player. And the question is, what do you see happen? Does the field change in time in a particular way? Does it vary in space in a particular way? Does the spatial pattern change in time? And one thing that's easy to forget when you're playing with these things is to set that global decay constant to zero. Um, if you don't set the global decay constant to zero, it won't break, uh, but you'll get a different result. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Are there any questions about that exercise? Is there any other, like, do you want us to initialize any other cells? Or so you simply just create, you don't need to create any cells and you don't need to have any of the constraints or forces turned on. This is a case where if you leave the boundary condition defaults, the way they come out of wizard, you'll notice it right away. There was a good question. Elmer said he, he did this and some cells showed up and the default in Twitit, a wizard is to create blob initializer or uniform initializer. So, uh, you could delete that. But again, it won't do any harm to have it. So there's nothing, there's no reason you have to get rid of it, but uh, you don't need it. it. Won't do anything. Okay, so I'm going to do this in Mana Hub. Try that again. Somebody can help me. Diffusion. Simple two. Okay. No shells. I know I. I didn't hit add. Next. Okay. And now I go to my XML. I have my metadata block, my pots block, which isn't going to do anything. My cell type block, which isn't going to do anything. And I have diffusion solver FE. And the instructions were to make the global diffusion constant to be one, the global decay constant to be zero, the initial concentration I need to uncomment, and I want to set that equal to one. Sorry, I would recommend, it should type convert, but I would recommend making it a float. Uncomment periodic boundary conditions. That's for X. Comment out the constant derivative boundary conditions. 
I'm talking that out the periodic boundary condition. And then I have uniform initializer here, which I don't need. I'm going to get rid of that. Okay. Save. And now I'm going to hit run, open in player. And I'm going to look at my oxygen field. Sorry. Okay. So the question, Elmer's question was, we already specified the boundary conditions of the POTS model. Why do we have to specify them again in the diffusion solver? Right. He says we had no flux boundary conditions for the cell lattice, and we now have periodic boundary conditions for the chemical field. And the answer is that in principle, uh, in a real system, those could be different. I could have uh, a, a container which allows oxygen to go through the boundaries, but doesn't allow the cells to go through the boundary, for example. I think it would be harder to have a container which allowed the cells to go through and didn't allow oxygen to go through. But uh, mathematically, I could imagine that would be the case. So I want to be able to define the oxygen, the, the boundary condition separately. And for different chemicals, I could in fact have different boundary conditions. I could have a membrane that allows oxygen through, but not water. I could have a membrane that allows ATP through, but not glucose. And so uh, I need to be able to have the flexibility of having separate boundary conditions for each species. Good question. So this is what I got. Did people get this? Did people need more time? Did people see what I did? Did people see that there was a bit of a trick question here? What happens when you run it? Anybody? Jonathan? No, nothing happens. The concentration was set to be one initially, it stays one. Because periodic boundary conditions create a flux when the, when the value on the left and the value on the right are different, but they're equal on the left and the right. The value is uniform everywhere, so there's no flow of material. There's no decay or source. So everything just stays one. So that's a pretty boring simulation. OK, does anybody need help getting that running? Because we're going to be using that now for a few minutes. Giuliano, do you want to see if you can help Elmer? Yeah. Who got something that looked like that? Maybe show of hands. How many people, or I could use the poll. You got it. Okay. Or is that a question? You got it. Okay. So if you got it working, try the second exercise. which would be setting constant value boundary conditions and make the boundaries have value of zero. If the first one isn't done yet for you, that's fine, keep working on it. But if you've gotten that first one done, try constant value boundary conditions. Is something, is something different when you use constant value boundary conditions?
And once you've done that first one with constant value of zero on the boundary, you could try a constant value of one on the boundary and a constant value of 10 on the boundary and see what happens. And if you're done with that, you could make the X and the Y boundaries have different values. In the model editor, I think you should be able to. I can try that. Let me see. So there was a good point, which is that you can try changing it. If you don't want to have to edit your code, you can try changing those values in the model editor and see what happens. You can't change, I don't think you can change the boundary conditions from periodic to fixed value, but once they're fixed value, you can change the value. Does anybody want to show me what they got? I, I can show you what I got because I'm a little confused in my results. Okay. So that good. I mean, I'm not, not good that you're confused, but good that you're willing to show us. <laughs> here, one sec. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get out of the way here. Okay. Okay, take it away. Okay. Um, so this is what I got. I got the same constant simulation here for all of the parameters that I put in. Um, okay. This is what my Twitter looks like. So. Oh, okay. So, uh, does anybody see what what's going on here? Specifying periodic boundary conditions overwrites the constant value specification. Uh, so I have to take this out? Yeah, there you go. Okay, try that. Let's see. Yeah, it's not going to behave. It's always the screen sharing with Zoom. Yeah, Zoom is a pain that way, isn't it? Okay, so you'll notice it's not completely red anymore. So now hit run. Yeah. So it looks like it's decreasing towards the middle. So it's a, so yeah, well, because what's happening? You set the value at zero at the boundary. Those are what are called absorbing boundary conditions. Okay. Basically, you've created a sink that's pulling the chemical out of the out of the medium. Mm. Now, you seem to still be in the y direction. You still have periodic boundary conditions. At the left and the right hand x side. Let's see why it didn't. Oh, I know why. Look at line sixty nine and seventy. Are those constant value? No. <laughs> That's what I said. The default is a little strange. It's not the same for X and Y. There you go. Here we go. Hmm. 
this time it should on the one on the one hand that's a little bit of a trap a little bit of a tank trap for people on the other hand uh at least it gives you something that looks strange so you know there's a problem there you go so now you've got the chemical flowing out from all four sides yeah okay and now what you could do is if you go into the model editor while it's running actually well, it's sort of a pain to do it okay you could now change the value on one of the sides from being one to 10 or zero to 10. Yeah, it's at the bottom and bounding. It's sort of, it's hard to see. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we could give like a max of 10. Make it 10. Yeah, there you go. And now that's going to turn into a source. You see, now you see the chemical flowing in. Yeah. Yep. So you see those boundary conditions are really critical for what happens. So is one for the visualization, is one just like a maximum? Does the, the 10 here, doesn't necessarily mean 10 here. So if you look in, it's probably hard to see, but it, it, it cause it doesn't, this, the, the font doesn't rescale very well. At the very bottom of that image, it should tell you what the maximum concentration is. Okay, yeah. And so uh, we could do this while you've got it open, we could do this. I was, gonna, I'll, I was gonna show some slides on it, but let's just do it here. If you go up to the uh, tools and you go to uh, configuration, and now you select field, yeah, you can say fixed or float. So if you float the top value now, Right. It'll now auto scale that color bar. Okay. Oh, huh. That's funny. And depending on what you're trying to do, you may want to have fixed values or floating values. Uh, or you may want to change the range because you may not care what the big, you may want to care, you may care about what's happening on the left where the values are small. Um, or what's happening on the right. There's another thing that's rather nice. And I'm not actually sure is in my slide deck because it was introduced fairly recently. If you go back to those settings there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a button called scale contours, scalar contours. And this will draw ISO values. And then you want to say, uh, so try try turning that one on. Should I put anything in here, or just leave uh, just leave it for the moment for the default? Okay, it's a little hard to see because of the. If you zoom in now, you'll see those white lines. Those white lines are identifying regions uh, of the same value. Uh, in the field, and you can adjust the number of them. Uh, it's setting it, it. You set it to draw three of them. You can, if you change that setting there, you could make it say make it draw ten or fifteen of them. Rather, there you go. Okay. Okay. So, because our eyes aren't very good at evaluating gradients by color. Those lines are, are very helpful for help, helping us understand what the concentration field looks like. Huh. Okay. Okay, there was a good question, which is why does changing the value of the constant value make something a source or a sink? Well, think about the statement that water flows downhill. If I've set my surface of my water to be one here, and I now say that the value at the boundary is zero, the water is gonna flow out in, into essentially, I've created a drain on the left, on the, on the edge. If I say my value at the middle is one, and I set my value on the outside higher, I've basically now got a source of water and water is gonna pour in from the outside. If I set the boundary value to be one, 
and the initial value was one, there wouldn't be any flow. So with diffusion, we always have movement of chemical when there are differences in concentration. So if the boundary is set to a high value compared to the concentration in the middle, I'll have flow of chemical into my field. If the boundary value is set to be low compared to what's in the middle, I'll have flow out. It sets the level on the edge, yes. Good question. Anybody else? Anything else there? Are people able to get this? Because it's important that we all have this working because if we don't, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, we're going to, you're going to have a long afternoon. Anybody need help? Um, mine's working. I have slightly different results. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, I also was like messing around with the different coefficients. Um, whoops. Mine looks like this. And that's, I know like I set my min to be zero, my max to be one. Yep. But if I have them the same, nothing happens. So I wasn't sure if that's supposed to happen or if it was just something on my end. So it looks like min on both sides is zero and max on both sides is one, mm -hmm. right? So you have a flow of material from the top right to the bottom left. So you see you have a gradient across like that. Okay, perfect. If you keep that running, Eventually, I think you'll see something where those those bends will straighten out, and you'll get a, you'll get more or less straight lines across the middle. Okay, now, that's awesome. pretty Thank deep. You. So there, there's actually I mean, this is a pretty in a sense seems like a very trivial situation. We're doing simple diffusion with constant diffusion constant. All we're doing is changing the boundaries, but in fact, you can get a lot of different situations with this. Anybody else have something, a question or something they want to show? That was great, Carmen, thank you. I'm a, I'm a little behind. Um, whenever I, I go on the CC3D and tools and configuration, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not letting me change any of the settings in the field. Do you want to show us? Do you want to screen share it? Let's see what- Yeah, sure. No, one second. I'm getting- um, the thing to display all right. I just can't change any of these parameters. Okay. I can show you it's what it as well if you want. Okay, let's look at the Twitter first. Oh well you're on a Mac, right? So I'm on a PC. Oh. Is it live? All right. Okay, it is a PC. All right, then then I then I'm always nervous. If I think somebody's on a Mac, I become paranoid because the Mac Mac releases a copy. So, okay, I see what's going on. At least one thing is going on. Okay. Uh, I see two things that are going on. Oh. Um, and actually, you, you have, uh, it looks like you have multiple fields here. Is that right? Um, you created field not, one, not, field two. Not intentionally. Uh, <laughs> not really sure why. Well, I think somehow when you when you were doing, you must have added two fields when you were doing the 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 wizard. But that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's just pick one though. Let's pick the first. Which one do you want to look at? Field one or field two? I'll just look at field one. Okay. So then scroll up a bit. In field two there. Okay, so you have field one. Okay. And the first thing is in line 46. So okay, let's look at line 45. The fusion constant is 0 0.1. So okay. So should yeah. type convert from 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 uh, integers to float, but I can't promise that they will. So I, I always recommend typing them as as a float if they're supposed to be floats. Okay, good. And now let's look at lines sixty and sixty one. So you have the bin, the constant value minimum and maximum, and you've got it set at ten and five. 
So why don't you try zero and zero to begin with? Ten and five are interesting, but but they're going to be a little bit different. And by the way, if you're done with this part of it and you want to go ahead, try using constant derivative boundary conditions. Start with constant derivative of zero and see what happens, and then try actually positive and negative values and see what happens. That yet to be pretty comp interesting. Okay. Okay, good. So you have constant value now of zero on the left and the right. And now look at line 67 to 68. And notice something else. Look at the beginnings of line 67 and 68. What do they say? Uh, constant derivative. Should they be constant right. value? So if you want it, well, I mean, that's your choice. But the, the exercise said make it constant value. So let's start with constant value. All right. And try zero and zero again. So save that and run it. Hmm. So you're running a different simulation. Weird. Uh, okay, now this should be okay. Name. Oh, you're using okay. Get rid of diffusion. Get get rid of the uh, the diffusion. This should be okay. The second one, why don't you get rid of that second field? Just delete that second field. But I don't think that's what the problem is. You, did, you didn't delete the whole thing, you only deleted part of it. Oh, okay. One more line, but this is it. Okay. Oh, I see what happened. Okay. Oh. Um, let's look look at your code again. So you also have so this this one you use diffusion solver, a different diffusion solver. Scroll down. You seem to have another copy of the diffusion solver. You also have diffusion oh. diffusion solver FE, which is the one you want. So why don't we get rid of that copy too? This one down? Yeah, create all that. Copy just that one line, 78, and move that up to where you defined the first field, because you want to use that one. There we go. That's good. And now, now uh, scroll down, get rid of the next one. The, the whole block or just this? The whole block. Okay, try that. And now you have to switch from cell field to, to visualize the chemical. All right. Okay. So you're making some progress. Where did you define, let's go back to the, the, the code. Where did you define the initial value of the field? Um, not sure. Yeah, you don't think you define the initial concentration. So we need to, we need to, uh, this is, um, Unfortunately, diffusion, the flex diffusion solver is slightly different code step, but let me give you the code for that. Actually, wait a sec, Giuliano, I can't, 
I can't cut and paste from foot from Compucel to uh, to uh, you need the initial concentration. So so in line fifty, you didn't define the initial concentration, so it's zero. You need to uncomment that and then set the initial value to one point zero. But right this is I think this is good for everybody to see how to do this. 1.0. All right. Now that, I'll try that. There you go. All right. Thank you. Great. I, I wanted to take the time to make sure everybody could get this to work because it, again, it's, I would say, it's not fair to say it's not, not complicated. There are a lot of options. And so it's easy to get to, to miss one of them or to to uh, to get confused about one. So I think it's important to take the time when we're just starting out to get familiar with what the switches are in the in the solvers. Um, once you've done it a few times, it'll be it'll be pretty easy because you tend to do the same thing over and over again. There are a lot of options, but we don't use a lot of them very often. The ones we use, we tend to use uh, pretty frequently. Does anybody else need help at this point? How about a thumbs up? If anybody needs help, uh, give me a thumbs up if you got everything working. Okay, everybody in here is okay. JH, is that working for you? No, Logan? Okay. All right. Well, I'll leave for a homework exercise playing with constant derivative boundary conditions. Did anybody try that while we were while we were troubleshooting? It it can be pretty interesting. You can get some pretty unintuitive results with constant derivative boundary conditions. Yep. No. All right. So, so there's another minefield with constant derivative boundary conditions, which is if you use constant derivative value, say 10 on the left and 10 on the right, one of them supplies material to the, to the cell, to the field, and the other one takes it away. And the question was, why is that? Well, the derivative is defined with respect to the x-axis. And so if you define a flow to the right, then you have an inflow on the left-hand margin and an outflow on the right-hand margin. So if you want inflow on both, you have to have plus 10 on the right to the left and minus 10 on the right to be symmetrical. And so that was the little stretch exercise I have on the screen share, was to try to play with that. That's, a, that's again, uh, mathematically it makes sense, but you'd say, you. Since constant value is, doesn't care about whether you're left or right, uh, you have to think a little bit more when you go to constant flux. So that's a good observation. Thank you for catching. Okay. The other thing that you can do, and we could do things that are reasonably complicated this way, is you can actually define um, rather elaborate initial concentration. We just said that the initial concentration was uh, one, but any simple function of position you can define. So X times Y would be a legal initial concentration. Or in this case, maximum of zero comma 10 minus X minus 100 squared plus Y minus 100 squared will draw a little a uh, circle uh, of concentration. And again, I don't think I want to go into too much detail there, but why don't people just try that one thing? Uh, in your, the simulation you have, replace that initial value of one with the form that's here on the screen, max of zero comma 10 minus 
and then a bunch of parentheses, x minus 100 squared plus y minus 100 squared. And tell me, somebody tell me what they get. So in our first case, we have the initial concentration field being uniform everywhere. Now we're going to create a not initially non-uniform concentration. And if that's too much typing, use your imagination and create a concentration field that you like. Any function, any simple function of position will work. Max, min, sine, cosine are all available. Times, divide, squared, all work. If you want to draw something really fancy, you might do it in Python, but most things you can do arithmetically. Give me a thumbs up when you've got that working. Okay. Uh, why is there distortion at the edges? Well, I think we have to think about what we've done here. Uh, X minus 100, Y minus 100, that will be zero at the position 100 comma 100. Uh, and it will get bigger as I go away from it. And so the result of this should be that I have a peak. It should give me a bump in the middle. Now, if I have, and then zero at the edges. Um, so this will basically define a, a little blob of material in the middle of my simulation, a circular blob of material in the middle of my simulation. If I have a constant value boundary conditions or constant flux boundary condition, then in addition to that, I'll have flow of material from the edges. So I don't know what, what boundary conditions you use. I'd say suggest going back to periodic boundary conditions to start out with it. Elmer, what did it do for you? Nothing. So for this one, if you start out with a little clump of material in the beginning, okay, so you're still having you're still having constant value boundary conditions at the edge, bro. So you're probably dominated by that. Did anybody else get anything? Um, again, I think this one it's more it's more interesting when you use periodic boundary conditions to start with. Right, so Elmer says if you wait long enough, the initial concentration disperses over the whole field, which is right. If you start with an initial concentration and then have it dis. Anybody else have something interesting? I think um, I had uh, something similar to Elmer. Um, okay. Somebody want to show me what they got? Sorry, if two people are speaking at once. Jonathan, and then who was? Somebody that else. Was me, sorry. No, that's fine. Carmen, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I think I got something a little bit different. I couldn't hear Elmer that well. Um, but mine started out like not directly in the middle, but um more so like towards the center as like a small circle and it's been expanding. Okay, that's that's what I would expect. That's exactly what I would expect. Anybody else?
there's a, there's actually a lot you can explore with just this very very simple set of of uh, conditions. So I want to I want to encourage you to play around with it a bit. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, do play. And there are all sorts of games you can play. The one that I did there put a blob of uh, a circular uh, concentration in the middle. This one puts it around the edge, which we'll skip for the moment. OK. So the next thing that I want to do is do a tiny bit of mathematics. And let's suppose that instead of having x and y variation, we just had variation of the x direction. In that case, the divergence and the gradient, both are just the derivative with respect to x. And the diffusion equation becomes the change in concentration versus time is the diffusion constant times the second derivative of the concentration with respect to space. At equilibrium, the change in time is zero. And that means that the second derivative with respect to space is zero, which means the first derivative with respect to space is a constant, which means that the concentration is x times a constant plus some other constant. In other words, it's linear, linear gradient. And in particular, that linear gradient is independent of the diffusion constant. The diffusion constant only matters for time changes. And so what will be, what will be happening is when we have a linear gradient is it's going to depend on the boundary conditions. It's going to depend on the values at the end. So if I define that the constant value at 0 was 100 on the left, and constant value at 100 was 0 on the right, then the concentration would be 100 minus x. The time that the profile takes to reach that equilibrium depends on the diffusion constant and the size of the lattice, in particular on the diffusion time. And we'll come back to that. So what I'd like people to do, and then we'll do this little exercise together, and then we will um, we will um, take a break after that, is I want you to write a simulation where you have a constant value on the left, a constant value of zero on the right. You could use periodic boundary conditions in the y direction. And I want you to see what the field looks like with time. And I'll give people a minute or two to try that out. And then we'll do it together. I think you have everything you need from what you've already done to be able to implement that pretty fast. You're going to say constant concentration on the x direction a value of, you could say 10 or one on the left, on the min, zero on the right, periodic in the y direction. And what you're gonna find is that the final value doesn't depend on the initial concentration. But you can play with that and try it out. So, 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 so Elmer says, when you do periodic boundary conditions, why don't you specify min and max? And the answer is that periodic boundary condition says that the value at min and max are equal to each other. So periodic does both at once. No, it just says that they're equal. So whatever the value on the left is, is forced to be the same as the value on the right.
So it creates a flux across the boundary that keeps the values equal. So when you take time by period, it can only be initial and it can be so Elmer says, if you start out with, if you have both X and Y direction periodic, then the boundaries themselves are not acting as a source or a sink of material. The amount of material you have in the system is fixed. It redistributes, but it doesn't come from, from the outside world because there is no outside world. If you use constant value, the outside world is acting as a reservoir, either taking material away or supplying it. Uh, yes, these could be called Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions. If you're a physicist or a mathematician, those terms will be familiar. If you're not either of those, those terms probably won't, won't uh, be meaningful. Okay, were people able to get this to work? This one? So let me do it myself. I said I want periodic in the Y. I want constant value. I'll make them 10 on the X min and zero X max. And I'm gonna start with the value of zero everywhere. I didn't tell you what value to use for initial condition, but it's most interesting when you do zero. Okay. Is the screen share working? You're seeing my CompuCell running? Yes. Okay, so now let's do this. My initial concentration is zero everywhere. And now I see chemical coming in from the left and flowing from that source towards the right. And you'll see it'll take quite a while. And this is a place where if I use that option in configuration, where I turn on scalar contours, let's put in 15 of them. You see these lines are spaced equally in the concentration. You'll see that they're close to each other on the left and further apart on the right, and they're moving to the right. So this is representing the flow of concentration across, across my, my simulation field. All right, so this reminds you what we did. We used the wizard. We turned off the de decay constant. We set the constant value on the on the min to be 10, right max to be zero. We put periodic boundary conditions in Y. And then when we looked at the field, we in the in the setting, in the configuration menu, uh, we changed to, uh, in this case, fixed top and bottom value. And I also turned on the, uh, the scalar contours, which I found useful. So we, in my case, I use fixed max and min values, but you can play with that. As I say, I find the scalar contours um, quite useful as well. So you should have gotten something like that.
it takes quite a while for that to uh, to uh, to equilibrate. Now, our, as I say, using those scalar contour values um, is not a bad way of visualizing the field. We're better at se sensing the separation between the contour lines than we are cutting the values in the colors. Um, but it is nice to be able to uh, to be able to measure concentration and plot it. We we learned how to do scientific plots a few weeks ago, and so we could plot the value. So what we'd like to do now is plot a graph. Uh, we're essentially going to take a cut along the midline in the y direction down the x-axis and plot that value. And so I want to introduce that. The plots, as we know, we have to do in Python. Maybe we should have uh, XML definitions of some basic plots, but we don't have that in CompuSum. And so we're going to go into the, I'm going to show you how to do a plot of the chemical concentration. And the one thing that we're going to have to be aware of when we're going to use chemical fields in Python is that while the cells and their attributes are automatically available in Python, we have to get a reference to the chemical field. And so the one thing that we're going to have to do is and if we go to CC3D Python and pull down the menu for chemical fields, uh, there's going to be a function that's called get field reference. And though there's a Python function called get concentration field, and you have to put inside that concentration field the name of whatever the diffusion field was. So if you called it oxygen, you have to put in oxygen. If you called it field underscore two, you have to put in field underscore two. And you have to only do that once inside of your function. Don't put that inside of a loop because it's a slow thing to do because it's moving a lot of uh, accents. Uh, and then once you have the field, you can reference the field just the way you would uh, a normal, uh, a normal. Uh, Python variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the concentration field. And then to read the concentration, we just use the, it's, it's effectively a NumPy array. So we just ask for the value at a given position. So if we want the value at 10 comma 10, uh, we have to remember that it is intrinsically 3D, so we need the third dimension, which will be zero. Uh, so we'll have value equals field of position 10 comma 10 comma zero. So if I want to uh, create a plot, I could go across and say for X in range zero to 100, I could say value is field of X comma Y, set y to be 50 or 100 in the middle. And then I can add a data point uh, to a plot, uh, which is the x position comma the value. One thing you'll find when you're doing plots is that as you add a lot of data points to plots, they get to be slow. And so a function that's useful is erase all data, which blanks the plot. Uh, you could try it either way. Okay. So based on what we have here and what you've learned already, why don't you try, spend five minutes trying to write a little program that creates a plot window. And then in your step function, Create the plot window in your start function. In the step function, get a reference to the field that you created. Uh, run through the X positions and add the value of the field at that X position to your plot. 
Is that a clear, is that a clear assignment? Any questions about that? And I certainly wouldn't do that every Monte Carlo step, every 10 Monte Carlo steps, or even every 100 Monte Carlo steps. If you use Twitit, Twitit will give you the correct syntax. And I will fix the slide. So let me show you the code that I wrote. In the start function, I added a plot window. Concentration called the x-axis x, the y-axis oxygen. I added a plot called oxygen dots size five. I added the step function every 50 Monte Carlo steps. My field reference I go to CC3D Python, chemical field, manipulation, get field reference. And this has the correct syntax, field equals self dot field dot name, in this case, oxygen. I set X in range zero to 256. I add to my plot oxygen comma X, the field value at X comma 128 comma zero. Now I'll leave that up for a minute for people to look at. If people did it a different way, that's fine. Let me know. Sorry. If you want to delete the, so let's look at what happens first if we run this without deleting it. So let me. So let's see what happens if I run it without deleting it. You see the concentration is zero most places and it begins to move in from the left. And I'm plotting every 50 Monte Carlo steps and I see the concentration is moving to the right and it's curved and it's gradually straightening out. And as I mentioned, if we keep doing this a lot, the number of points in the plot will get to be very big. Although it's sort of interesting to see how they change too. And so let's come back to the simulation. If I want to erase my plot, CC3D Python, scientific plots, erase plot. Self plot window, erase all data. What could be sort of fun is it's sort of interesting to see the difference between two consecutive ones. So I could put in here, if not MCS percent 100, and then erase the plot. So now it'll plot two and then erase and two and then erase. So let's try that. except I should probably put the erase before the plot so that it looks cleaner. I'm going to reverse the order. Okay, so let me start that again. Uh, 
How's that going for people? Did they get something like that? Do people want to see the code again? You want to work on it on your own? How's it going? Would I actually be able to see that one more time? Because I'm getting a strange result and I'm not really sure why. There are a lot of different ways you could achieve more or less the same thing. Does that make sense, Gabriel, what we've got there? Yeah, no, that's much right. I, I, I forgot to do the first part with the erase all data, so it was looking a little wonky. Well, there's nothing wrong with seeing the history of all the values. It just, it just uh, uh, as time goes on, there are a lot of points, and again, the the player redraws the, the plot every time. So when you add one point to a, a plot with a million points, it has to replot a million points. So it gets slow if you have lots and lots of points in a plot. Anybody else? Is that working for you? So the only thing we really had to remember was that we had to know whatever we called our field. Here I called it oxygen, so I have to remember that it was called oxygen. So if I don't remember, I have to go to my XML. Look what I called it here. And then copy that. If you've already got this working, you could try changing the interval at which you plot. You could also try changing the initial concentration. I started with zero concentration, but you could start with a different initial concentration and see what happens. Does anybody need more time? All right. So 
So we should have gotten something that looked like this, which we did. We see the concentration moving from the left to the right. And so this comes back to this concept of a diffusion time, which I want to talk about a little bit. So the diffusion time is the typical time a molecule takes to move a given distance via diffusion. And there is often a factor of two, depending on whether you're in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions. So there could be a numerical prefactor. But the proportionality is independent of dimension. And so the time it takes a molecule to diffuse a distance L is proportional to the distance squared divided by D, where D is the diffusion constant. So diffusion slows down rapidly over longer distances. And we saw that in the simulation we just ran. The concentration started out filling in the left-hand side very quickly, but then to get all the way to the right, it took quite a while. So there are two things that we have to deal with in biology. One of them is that distances vary a lot. Over a length distance of microns or tens of microns inside of a cell, diffusion is very fast for most molecular species. On the other hand, over the length of a neuronal axon, which can be a meter, diffusion is essentially infinitely slow. The other thing is that diffusion constants of biological molecules vary a lot, as in a factor of 10 to the eighth. So a potassium ion, which is one of the fastest diffusing things that we're going to run into biologically, has a diffusion constant of 2,000 microns squared per second. That means that over distances of hundreds of microns, potassium is essentially equilibrated by diffusion. GFP the fluorescent molecule that people use in experiments to track cell behaviors has a diffusion constant of about seven microns squared per second. DNA is a very large molecule. It has a diffusion constant of about five times 10 to the minus fourth microns squared per second. Of course, that's going to depend a little bit on how big your DNA molecule. For oxygen, we're more in the regime of potassium. It's a little bit lower. And it sets a diffusion time of 10 or 20 seconds for a length scale of about 100 microns, a couple of hundred microns. And what this means is that it takes that, that in order for oxygen to reach our tissues, we need to have a capillary which supplies oxygen within about a millimeter, a little bit less than a millimeter, 500 microns, half a millimeter. Yeah. yeah. So Elmer asked the question, is the fact that diffusion has units of length squared per time dependent on the dimensionality of the problem? Is it different in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions? Would it be length cubed in three dimensions? And the answer is no. The scaling of diffusion as the time as square of the distance is a function only of the diffusion equation itself. It comes about because the rate of diffusion is proportional to the second derivative in space. And that's where that length squared comes from. And so that scaling, the prefactor, there's a numerical prefactor which will be different. In other words, whether the time is length squared over t or length two length squared over t or something else 
there'll be a proportionality constant that will be different, but the scaling will be independent of the dimension. A typical small protein has a diffusion constant of about 100 microns squared per second. So if we want something to reach, go across the cell over a period of a few seconds, tens of microns is the maximum difference distance over which diffusion is effective. If we have a protein, if we, sorry? Yes. So if a protein diffuses at 100 microns squared per second, and we ask how long it takes to go a meter, well, you can calculate how long that is. A meter is a thousand, mic a thousand millimeters. It's 10 to the sixth microns. So a meter squared is 10 to the 12th micron squared. 10 to the 12th micron squared divided by 100 is 10 to the 10th second. So it takes 10 to the 10th seconds for a protein to go a meter by diffusion. 10 to the 10th seconds happens to be 300 years. So if I am a neuron, a motor neuron with an axon that's a meter long, and my signals in my neurons went only by diffusion or the transport of material that was made in the sum of the cell to the end of the axon was only by diffusion, it would take 300 years for the signal to get from one end of the neuron to the other. So that tells you something pretty profound, which is you can't use diffusion over long distances. Bacteria. do almost everything inside their little cytoplasm by diffusion. They don't have a lot of active transport. They have some, but not a lot. And that limits the size of the bacteria to a few microns. There are a few bacteria that are bigger uh, and they cheat a little bit. The other thing that we can think about in this context is that with normal diffusion happens in a free environment. So typically we think about the diffusion constant of a chemical in water. But the inside of a cell is full of large molecules and our diffusing species have to move around those molecules. They have to move around the edges of those molecules. That's what's called hindered diffusion. And that hindered diffusion can usually leads to it taking longer for molecular species to get from one place to another. Um, we can also have a situation where molecules are stuck in the membrane of a cell and they can't move in or out of, in or out of the membrane, but they can move freely within the membrane. And so some molecules are diffusing in two dimensions along the membrane surface of the cell. And other molecules are diffusing within the cell in the cytoplasm or across the membrane. For most molecular species that we care about, the membrane of the cell inhibits the movement but doesn't prevent it entirely. It depends a little bit on whether the molecular species is hydrophobic or hydrophilic, uh, whether it can cross the membrane or not. Uh, molecules like water get across the membrane relatively rapidly. Oxygen gets across the membrane relatively rapidly. But large molecules don't go across the biological membrane very much at all. And a lot of charged ions don't go across the membrane very well at all. And so there are a whole bunch of channels of various kinds that can control transport across the membrane. So for example, water or glucose 
can get across the membrane of a cell by themselves. They don't need help. Um, ions like uh, potassium and calcium have a hard time crossing the membrane. Uh, and they get transported typically either by ion channels, which are basically holes in the membrane, or by transporters, which are actually pumps. And there are a whole variety, there are a whole variety of there are a whole variety of pumps that move materials across the membrane. Some of these are activated by ATP. Some of them use gradients of other molecular species. So they'll move one calcium ion in and move one potassium ion out at the same time, called an antiport, or there'll be a symport where they move two molecules together. And so there are a whole variety of possible ways of moving things across membranes. CompuCell at the moment, the diffusion solver does not have an explicit way of handling uh, the fact that there is hindered diffusion at surfaces of cells. And so if you want to do that, we have to create an explicit representation of a membrane. And so what we're going to do uh, at the for the rest of this class is create a little simulation which is now going to which is going to use the code that you've already written and create a barrier. So take the code that you've already written and now use the uniform initializer to draw a line of square cells down the middle of your simulation from the top to the bottom and create them of a single frozen cell type, call it membrane. And if it's frozen, you don't have to define any of its other properties. You don't have to give it a target volume or anything like that. And then the simulation you've already written where the chemical is coming in from the left and disappearing to the right and being plotted is fine. So what you're going to do is take the simulation you just wrote and you're going to create a new cell type that you call membrane. You'll make it frozen. And then you'll draw a bar of frozen cells down the middle of the simulation. Any questions about that as a little exercise? And again, give me a thumbs up when you've got it working or ask if you have a question about it. Sorry? So you'll have to, the cell type plugin is there, but you'll have to add a cell type to it called membrane. And you'll have to add the, the, the command freeze to it. I think that should be there in the, in the uh, put it uh, CC3D ML code snippet. Let me check. So let's see, can I change it here? So I go to cell type, replace, 
medium membrane freeze add okay So let me do that again for people on the on the um, let me show people how to do. So the first thing I did was go into the XML. Let me undo this, put it back the way it was. This is the cell type that I had. I go into the CC3D ML, plugins, cell type. I'm going to replace the one I had. Please define cell types. I do membrane. I click freeze. I hit add. I hit OK. And now it's added membrane cell type. Frozen. And now at the bottom, I need to draw my initial condition that's a steppable. I'll do uniform initializer. I want it to start in the middle, more or less of my simulation. So I'll do X ranges between 120 and 124, say. Y will go from zero to 256. The size of the cells, I'll make four. Okay. Let's see if that works. No guarantee I got it right. Yeah. See, I've got a vertical bar. It's a steppable. Uniform initializer is a steppable. So here I'm going to run my simulation. And people tell me how it's different from what I did before when you run it. Okay, I'll show the code again. I changed the cell type, adding a frozen cell type named membrane. I added uniform initializer. Box min, x of 120, box max of 124, 0, 256. Made the cells four across. I could make them bigger if I wanted. When I run that, do I see, did that do anything? Somebody online, did that change the field at all? Not at all. Didn't change the field at all. Okay, so it's not a membrane yet, or at least it's a membrane that lets everything go through. So let's come back to our, our example here. Here I made the membrane in this demo, I made it a little bigger than the one I did here. And it didn't do anything. So now I can do something that CompuCell does, which is very nice, which is that I can define a diffusion constant that's different in different positions or cell types. And so I can now say that my diffusion constant in my membrane is zero. How do I do that? Oops, sorry. 
I'm going to go into my diffusion statement. I'll define diffusion coefficient, cell type equals membrane, and then I'll set the value to be zero. Let's see that in our code here. Well, that one is not, I, I, unfortunately, I deleted all of those options. So I now have to go back. Let's look at my simulation here. Diffusion coefficient, cell type equals membrane and diffusion coefficient. So this looks like global diffusion constant, except instead of diffusion constant, it's called coefficient. I get rid of global. And I have to type cell type equals membrane. So why don't people try that out? Those were actually present, would be present automatically when I, if I set everything up with wizard, but then we'd have to go back and redo it. So I'm going to leave it here. Does somebody want to try that and tell me what they get? Anybody online, is that working, not working? If you want to see the code, I can show my code, but were people able to draw the barrier, all right? Would I actually be able to see the barrier one more time? For some reason, I'm having trouble with it. Do you want to see the code for the barrier here? Well, I, that makes a barrier that's four voxels across. But maybe, maybe that's too thin. Let's make it 120 to 130. Gabriel, is that what you needed? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Huh? Sorry, say that again, Elmer. Yes. Oh, uh, Elmer says, why do you see the outline of the cells in the in the chemical concentration field? And the answer is that there, there's a ghost of those there so that you can see where the cells are by default. No, it's always there. The colors are not there. They're not, they're not colored by the cell type, but, but the positions are marked. So I'm going to put in the the cell, the, the, the diffusion constant. And the decay constant. So this is specifying that the diffusion constant is different in the cell from everywhere else. And I'm going to start out by setting the diffusion constant to be zero inside the cell, inside the membrane. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, the answer is I have a typo. What was my typo? Thank you. Thank you. Mismatch tag. Oh, because I have been changing it. I think actually constant works as well as coefficient, but it, the problem was that the closed tags weren't. Ah. All right. What's going to happen when the chemical gets to the wall? Maybe I should have made the simulation a little smaller so it, it ran faster. But what's going to happen when the chemical gets to the wall? I made the diffusion coefficient zero in the membrane. So in principle, no chemical to get across. And so my wall really is a wall.
I could speed things up by making the diffusion coefficient in the, the global diffusion coefficient bigger. So it didn't take quite so long to run. Are people able to get that? Gabriel, you say you've got it. That's good. Nick, you've got it. Okay. For people who are still working on it, if you want me to show you the code again, I can do that. Uh, if people have already gotten this, now try making the diffusion constant in the wall something non-zero. Make it a number that's not zero, but small compared to the diffusion constant everywhere else. And then you could also try making it big compared to the diffusion constant everywhere else and see what the shape of your profile is when you do that. Yeah. Why is my membrane red? Uh, let's see. It's just the color of the cells. I made them small cells. If I change the setting, let's see, configuration, cell color, cell border color, let's make it black. Not black. So you'll see here the concentration is blocked completely. Now, this is one place where I think if you edit it in the model editor, it won't work because they're frozen cells. So I think it won't, it will, it won't update the diffusion field constant, will it? So let's see. Doesn't give me the value. I hear it. So let's see if I make the diffusion coefficient in the membrane 10. I know it does work. So here I've made the diffusion coefficient in the membrane to actually be higher than the background. And you'll see that the concentration is pretty flat inside the membrane. It's actually flatter than it is elsewhere. Again, maybe I should make the global diffusion constant bigger so thing runs a little faster. Let me make the diffusing constant in the membrane one. And so now the membrane is acting as a barrier. You see, the concentration on the inside is bigger than the concentration on the outside. But there is transport across the barrier. And so this is a way, if one is patient, that you can actually implement jump diffusion cross membrane in CompuSol. To do that, you have to draw your cell as two concentric regions. You draw a cytoplasm with a high diffusion constant, then a region around the cytoplasm that has a lower diffusion constant. And you can you can get you can play with that. Any questions about that? Did people get that to work? Do people want to see the code that I wrote? Okay. So 
we added two lines, diffusion coefficient, cell type membrane. The last game I would like people to play tonight, and if you're working on this, keep working on it, but if you're not, if you're done with this, is use the uniform initializer, a second call to uniform initializer, to create a little region of membrane, to create a little gap in the bound in, in the in the in the membrane. So you have membrane in a line here, a little gap, and then membrane at the bottom. You could do that in two ways. You could either overwrite the membrane that you just drew with medium, or you could simply draw a band of membrane here and a band of membrane underneath with a hole. Try that and tell me what happens. And in that case, having the membrane actually have a diffusion coefficient of zero is interesting. This would correspond to an ion channel. I'm going to go ahead and do it while we're talking. So I took the box definition duplicated it, made the first one go from Y0 to 120, the second one go from 130 to 256. And now, a little bit more interesting. Let me go back, I'm gonna change that diffusion constant to be a little faster. The beginning, so it doesn't take so long to run. What do people think is going to happen with that hole? What's going to happen? You see the chemical is leaking through the hole and you're getting a semicircular distribution. It's acting as a point source on the right-hand side. And you'll notice there's a depletion of chemical on the left-hand side, inside the, inside, just under the membrane, near the hole, the concentration is lower than it would be elsewhere.
And so here you can see the chemical leaking through that hole and gradually spreading on the right hand side. If people want to see the code again, all I did was change the uniform initializer to draw two pieces. A top compartment component and a bottom. Were people able to get that to work? Gabriel, you got it. You got it. And now you can play with all sorts of different games. You can have multiple holes. You can have the holes have different uh, diffusion constants from the rest of the material. You can have the medium, the membrane be semi-permeable. The one thing that we can't do with this kind of method is doing active pumping. We can't do the equivalent of having an ion, uh, an actual pump through the channel that moves material actively. To do that, we have to, we have to, so if we make the diffusion constant of the membrane higher than the medium, what we'll see is that the, if we look at our plot of the concentration, the concentration will go down at some rate, It'll be almost flat in the membrane, and then it'll go down again on the other side. So, so, but that's not equivalent to active pumping. If we were active pumping, you'd actually see it go up. The concentration would go up through the membrane. I don't know what will work, what will happen if you try that. You could try it. You could do it in the model editor and see what happens. I don't. I think it will crash, but I don't know. We can try. Let's try. Never tried that one. Diffusion. Blank. Yeah. So, so I'm afraid it doesn't it doesn't work when you make the diffusion constant. Good idea though. Actually, in the fall class, in the fall class, where um, where I teach network modeling, that that effectively does work. Uh, in reaction kinetics, when you're trying to find the stable fixed points, that's easy. You run time forward. If you want to find the unstable fixed points, you have to run time backward. And you do that by changing the sign of all the diffusion of all the reaction rates. You make all the reaction rates negative. And that actually does work in that case. Uh, but here I'm afraid the numerical solvers don't like it, so it doesn't work. But, but in principle, that could. In practice, if you want to do a pumping, what you would have to do is each one of those little squares that we've defined. You'd have to actually move material by hand into those squares and out of those squares at the right rate. And that would be a bit of a bear. You can do it, and I've done it, but it's a pain. There is a there is a program called VCell out of University of Connecticut that, that is designed specifically to handle ion channels and transporters. And they have all sorts of beautiful predefined uh, transport relations across boundaries for their diffusion cell.
Okay, how are people doing with this example? So here was what we got. Sorry, I've got it to read through the switch. Here's what we got. If the diffusion constant in the membrane is lower than that outside, you get a steeper boundary condition. If the diffusion constant is zero, you get no diffusion across the membrane. And we did the ion channel example. And you'll see, depending on the size of the channel, and the permeability of the material, you can get a whole variety of different patterns. 